Oh, Domino's. Jesus. Hang on. Uh, we're into all the Roger Moore movies now, which I have here in my hand. I have got the man, oops, the man with the golden gun, the spy who loved me, Moonraker, For Your Eyes Only, and Octopussy. Film number one, which is actually number two in our Roger Moore, James Bond journey, would be The Man with the Golden Gun. Overall, I really enjoyed this movie. There's a lot of really silly things about it. But I like silly, okay? You know. I like it when they don't take themselves too seriously and they like to poke fun at themselves. This one, I don't know how much of that is intentional, but there's some really, really stupid things going on in this movie. Uh, first of all, got to mention the villain, played by Christopher Lee, legendary Hammer film actor. Went on to become Saruman. Have you heard of him? Count Dooku? You know, I mean, come on. Christopher Lee plays a Francisco Saramanga. And uh, Saramanga is a world-renowned, well, notorious, let's say, assassin. Uh, assassinates his victims with his signature golden gun uh, that fires golden bullets. And for some reason, he's also notorious for having... A third nipple. Yeah, no, I didn't make that up. It's pretty dumb. Not just a movie in general, but the fact that he has a third nipple. Couldn't it just be something else, like uh, he has a lazy eye or something? But no, they had to go with the third nipple. It's like a fun house kind of thing built into his secret mansion, secret island lair, and uh, which is curated by uh, none other than Hervé Villachez. Uh, who you may remember as Tattoo from the Fantasy Island series back in the 70s. I think this predates that a couple of years. Francisco Saramaga has a uh, secret lair, secret island lair, uh, which he eventually lures James Bond into uh, so that he can stalk him and assassinate him in his, like, funhouse lair or whatever. And I'm not kidding when I say funhouse because it's like, it's like a wax museum. But it's also like, you know, you go down a slide and the spinning tube and all that stuff. And like a fun house. The fun house of wax killing death, you know. That's what's going on, I suppose. Uh, a scene where Roger Moore actually impersonates Francisco Saramanga. And uh, he gets Q, you know, Q, the gadget guy at uh, MI6 gets him to manufacture a fake nipple that he can put on so he's got three nipples and he shows up to like some kung fu dojo and they're like oh who the hell are you and he's like whips his shirt open and he's got a third nipple well that's proof enough right i guess um so an appearance by a character that was featured in the previous movie in live and let die now, remember in Live and Let Die where they had the boat chase um, amongst the Louisiana swamps or whatever, and he had the uh, the old uh, southern country sheriff, Sheriff J.W. Pepper. He's the, the fat, loudmouth, bigoted country sheriff um, in Live and Let Die. Wait, this guy was supposed to be like the comic relief. He is not very funny. Um, but I guess they thought he was entertaining enough. This uh, southern stereotype that they threw in there. Um, they thought he was entertaining enough to bring him back for the man with the golden gun. Now, the man with the golden gun takes place primarily in Southeast Asia. Uh, specifically, like, Thailand. Now, they brought this guy back. And apparently, he's on vacation with his wife. Vacationing in, in the exact same town, the exact same spot as James Bond is pursuing his quarry. Uh, and the guy's like a tourist or whatever. And he's wearing this big stupid looking Hawaiian shirt and a big cowboy hat or whatever. 
and it's Sheriff J.W. Pepper, don't you, like, and he's spouting all these racist comments and stuff, and, and uh, you know, dealing with the local population, and then suddenly James Bond comes in, and, and he, like, commandeers his boat or whatever, and it just happens to be the same guy, and the guy's like, oh, I remember you, you were that British spy fella, and, like, it's excruciating to watch, actually, because they thought he was so funny in that first movie that they had to bring him back for this one, Really, I mean, you couldn't pick another character from the previous movie that you bring back for laughs or whatever. Even the cab driver guy from Live and Let Die. But no, you had to bring back the, the stupid old racist sheriff. And, and I'm not exaggerating when I say racist because I don't want to repeat the, the stuff that they let this character get away with saying in, um, in A Man with Golden Gun. Anyway, it amounts to nothing. Uh, it's just mostly the guy falling over in the back seat and going, what the hell are you doing, boy? And, you know, talking in the stereotypical voice. And uh, I guess that's what British people thought about Americans at the time. I don't know, 1974, man. This is a fun movie. Oh, oh there's one more really dumb part i got to point out. And it's one of the signature parts of the movie, actually. Um... Francisco Saramanga, Christopher Lee, um, who is fantastic in the movie, by the way. I can't say enough about Christopher Lee. I love the guy. And he made the movie. If, if he wasn't in it, this would be garbage. He's being pursued, and he drives his car into, like, what looks like a barn or whatever, but it turns out to be a big hangar. He drives his car, he backs his car in, and then he backs underneath this, like apparatus that is supposed to attach to the car and it, it basically it's like a an airplane and then he drives his car out of this hangar slash barn whatever and it's got wings on it and then he flies away drives really fast and then takes off and, and they really built that that i think a flying car is the dumbest thing ever because if like if you were this is 1974, man. Like, if you were rich enough to have a secret barn where you could stash your attachment for your car that makes your car fly, wouldn't you just park a plane in there, park outside, jump in the barn, jump in the plane, and then just fly the plane out of there? Like, why the extra, like, 60 seconds you know, of, like, prep time, and then they show us, like, you know, and James Bond or whoever must have been, like, waiting outside, and, like, a, oh, what do we do? Oh, he's in there. I'm not sure. Should we go in there? Should we go get him? And the, meanwhile, he's, like, hooking up his hooking up his wings, you know, and to fly out of the garage. It's just so dumb. Like, just buy a plane, dude. Like, I don't know. 1974, man. What are you going to do? And then, I think uh, out of the five movies in this selection, the of Roger Moore, James Bond movies, uh, out of these five, I think this is my favorite one. The Spy Who Loved Me. Now, before I go any further, i got to explain reason number one for this being my favorite movie is it has the absolute best theme song. Uh, the song is called Nobody Does It Better. It's performed by Carly Simon, uh, also covered by Radiohead many, many, many years in the future. Well, to us it would be the past, uh, I guess like 2002 or something. But anyway, Spy Who Loved Me 1977 has a great theme song. And yes, they play the crap out of it just like they did for Live and Let Die. But it's a way better song. And, um, there's some really cool stuff that happens in this movie. The, uh, uh, basic plot of this is there's a com competing Russian agent working on a very similar mission to James Bond. And they cross paths and eventually fall in love. Because remember what I said about, you know, James Bond, he can convert any woman even if she's an evil secret agent. In this case, not, well, maybe not evil, but, you know, 
1977, I guess, uh, she works for the Russian government. Uh, she's like KGB agent. So in 1977, Russian KGB equals evil in Western perception. She's played by Barbara Bach, gorgeous actress. Uh, she does a really good job in here. She has, she's got her Russian accent down, I think. It works well enough for me. I, I personally don't converse with that many actual Russian people, so sounds convincing enough to me. Uh, this is the one that introduces Jaws. Now, you know who I'm talking about. You know, the big, super tall guy, the big, huge guy with the metal teeth. And, uh, you know, uh, basically kill you by biting you. Which is a weird power for, you know, in the age of gunfire. It's kind of a weird thing to have. Like, I mean, I, I'm sure he shot a gun a few times in there too, but uh, that was his way of dispatching his victims. Um, now, played by Richard Kiel. He comes back in the next movie. Uh, because at the end of this one, uh, a lot of this has to do with underwater stuff, and I'll talk about that in a second. But at the very end of this movie, when we think Jaws is actually going to die, Jaws the character, not Jaws the shark, when we think he's going to die, he actually has to fight a shark. And they show him at the end, and because, like, in the test screening, the audiences love that character... And then they saw him die, and it's like, oh man, you should, you should do more with that guy. You should bring him back. And he actually kills the shark and comes back in the next movie. And we'll get to that. Anyway, yeah, a lot of underwater action. Uh, has the famous underwater car. Uh, it's a Lotus, I believe, is the make of car. I don't care about these things. But uh, it's, uh, it looks really neat. It's like, oh my god, we're going to drive in the water. What are you doing? What are you doing? Oh, just hang on one second, darling. It flicks a switch and then and the fins pop out and the wheels flip in. And it's got a little jet propeller in the back. And it's pretty high tech, man. And it fires, you know, it, it drops mines and stuff. And it fires missiles. And that's pretty badass. That's pretty space age for 1977. Speaking of 1977, there was a little movie uh, came out that year that kind of disrupted a lot of everything, the world, I suppose. Um, of course, I'm talking about Star Wars. Now, this was in the theater pretty much around the same time as Star Wars. And if Star Wars wasn't out, this probably would have been top one or two movies for sure and this it did really well it was really successful but it was kind of like this was like uk star wars versus american star wars uh, at least in my own experience it seemed like more mature people wanted to go with a james bond the established this is what action movies should be none of this kitty fantasy you, you know, that's just silly. That's for kids. James Bond is more sophisticated. Than... <laughs> it is not more sophisticated than Star Wars. If anything is going forward even and looking backwards from this point, from 1977, James Bond was always dumb. It's, uh... Anyway, The Spy Who Loved Me is a fun movie. Uh, I think you should check this one out. Um, as I said, out of this chunk of five movies that I have, probably my favorite. And then, of course, speaking of Star Wars, which we just were, right? Uh, James Bond, two years after Star Wars, decided to uh, retaliate. Um, they were like, oh my god, like kids love this space stuff. It's got... You know, laser beams and, you know, outer space. We have an old James Bond novel that happens to take place in space. Unfortunately, that was written in, like, before mankind had even reached the moon. But they uh, adapted it, and they went with it, and they called it Moonraker. 
Now, it was announced at the end of The Spy Who Loved Me that For Your Eyes Only would be the next James Bond movie. And it was not. So they broke their promise because they had to get that space stuff in there. And yeah, Moonraker is... There's some space stuff in it. You know, mostly near the end, like the last third of the movie, I guess, takes place in space. And um, you don't see a whole lot. Of, I mean, I guess there's some, like lasers shooting and stuff like that. And there's some uh, spaceships and there's a space station. It ain't Star Wars, I'll tell you that. And any kid that was thinking, oh, it's spacey. Let's go see the new James Bond movie, Dad. Like... You know, that kid was expecting Star Wars, and you gave him The Spy Who Loved Me in Space. Uh, which didn't turn out that well. I mean, there's some good things about it. It's a, it's a fun movie to watch, I suppose, if you're into the James Bond nostalgia thing. Uh, Jaws returns, and actually converts into being a good guy by the end of this movie. And... Uh, Apparently lives and finds the love of his life and lives forever in paradise in space or something. Moonraker. Uh, very little of it actually takes place on the moon. As a matter of fact, I don't think any of it takes place on the moon. But uh, there's a reason why it's called Moonraker and uh, watch a movie and find out, I suppose. Actually has a really good um, opening scene. There's like a skydiving scene. Uh, where James Bond is forced to, f well, I guess, fall out of an airplane with no parachute. Um, which, of course, he doesn't die. Uh, he's remedied by, um, you know, he falls on another dude that's wearing a parachute and commandeers a parachute and kills the dude. But he's also chased by Jaws, who comes back in this movie, of course. And that's a really good scene. There's like a mid-air fight scene you can tell that uh, a lot of this stuff was actually performed like a lot of this uh, skydiving stunts and stuff were actually performed maybe not by the actors but still somebody did it and it's it's really good it's really exciting and and I'm not making this up the female protagonist's name is Holly Goodhead and I can see they're not getting rid of that tradition anytime soon with the ridiculously sexist uh, female names. Uh, I don't know when that's going to completely disappear. Anyway, there's uh, that's a really good scene where uh, Jaws pursues the two of them. They're in, they're in Rio de Janeiro and uh, they're on the cable cars. And actually Jaws like bites through the cable and stuff and it's, it's you know, it's silly but it's kind of cool and that's where he meets the love of his life, in case you were wondering about that. So yeah, Moonraker, 1979. Definitely a product of its time. It, uh, it's not the worst of the James Bond movies, or even the worst of the Roger Moore James Bond movies. But it just kind of goes by. Yeah, take what you want out of it. It's okay. I think the studio took a step back, or the writers, or the uh, producers of James Bond 007 movies took a step back and they said you know let's have a little bit more grounded a little more realistic a little more real world uh, James Bond movie and uh, you know Moonraker still was a success it's not like it lost money or anything they um, but they kinda wanted to get back to the roots sort of thing uh, so then we get for your eyes only Probably the most, uh, maybe not the most serious, but the most, as I said, the most grounded of the James Bond movies, certainly of the, uh, of the Roger Moore era. Um, this was the first James Bond movie I ever saw in the theater. Now, of course, I was too young or hadn't been born yet, rather, for all the Sean Connery movies, but uh, with the exception of one, and that one's coming up. But for Roger Moore, I mean, uh, I'd heard about The Spy Who Loved Me, and I'd heard about Moonraker, as well as all those old ones, and I was like, how come it's a different guy? And people had to explain that to me. 
But uh, by the time For Your Eyes Only came out in 1981, this is post Star Wars, post Empire Strikes Back, post Moonraker, where, yeah, they wanted to get back to something that's like, this is why James Bond is popular. It's not because we're imitating any other form of movies, anything like that. It's because we have James Bond and we're going to put him in some spy situations. It's going to be an international globe-spanning adventure. Uh, lots of action. Beautiful women. Well, that's just James Bond movies for you. And um, I really like this one, actually. It's a little slower moving than some of the other ones, but it's not full of a bunch of cheesy jokes. There's a few cheesy jokes in it, but it's not full of all those dumb Roger Moore one-liners. Well, it's not full of them, but they're in there. But it has a pretty cool storyline, I think. Um, it's about a kind of a... Who is the villain, and why are they a villain? What, you know, basically just all boils down to money and, you know, some politics, but not too much. I mean, they're not going to blow up the moon or anything like that, or, you know, make the Earth uninhabitable and repopulate the species, like in the last one, I guess. Okay, this one is more, I don't know, way more real world. There's uh, actually a pretty good... Um, sort of side plot where the villain has a niece that uh, a young beautiful blonde skating ice skating protege that uh, falls in love with James Bond and she insinuates herself in his life and kind of gets in the way she becomes a liability she uh, she's a goofy character and um, you know, James Bond, oh, he's far too much of a gentleman to take advantage of such a, such a young, naive woman. And, um, but it really, uh, I don't know, still hammers home that point that James Bond can get any woman, any woman. Except for that lady with the knife that came about her shoe and from Russia with love. I don't, I don't think she was interested in him that way. The best part of the movie, I think, is like the kind of climbing sequence. Uh, where they have to, um, or James Bond rather, has to uh, scale a cliff near the end uh, to stop the villains and, you know, wrap up the story and whatever. And uh, that's actually pretty good. Uh, you know, first time I'd ever seen, like, rock climbing or that kind of stuff on screen. I was a kid, like I said. And this was the first one that I saw in the theater. I guess I was expecting something more like... The Spy Who Loved Me with the, the crazy car and or um, Moonraker where they're shooting lasers on the moon or in space, not on the moon. Uh, I guess I was expecting a little bit more. Uh, so I was a little disappointed and it kind of turned me off of James Bond. But, you know, I was like, I came out of that thinking, yeah, that was exciting. You know, stuff happened and it was, it, it was no Star Wars, that's for sure. But it's James Bond and that's what kind of movies... They're going to be, pretty much. And I don't think I was wrong in my perception of that. Uh, action movies, uh, you know, there's a good bit of racy scenes. Like, you know, there's some sex in there. and I mean, it's nothing gratuitous or anything like that. A lot of suggestive sexuality, but not anything blatant thrown in your face. Um, yeah. Fear Eyes Only is a pretty good movie. The theme song, Sheena Easton, bleh, never liked that song. She Ain't No Carly Simon. The best part of that whole movie is the very beginning of it. James Bond is at a grave site, and he's visiting the grave of his deceased wife. Now, if you remember, I don't think I even mentioned it in my video of containing that movie, now, if you remember, James Bond was actually briefly married on screen. It took place on Her Majesty's Secret Service. And uh, way back in 1969, in that movie, he got married. There was five minutes left in the movie. And uh, they're driving away on their honeymoon. 
and Blofeld. Remember Blofeld? Remember that guy? Bald guy, or at the time he was bald, uh, has a white cat. You know, got a weird scar on his face, or at least the Donald Pleasance version did. Um, Blofeld and his cronies assassinate James Bond's brand new wife as they're driving away from the honeymoon. And that movie just ends right there. Now, at the beginning of For Your Eyes Only, there's a scene where James Bond is visiting the grave of his deceased wife a few years later, I suppose, because, of course, the movie is, well, over a decade later. And he's visiting her grave and uh, suddenly gets coerced into a helicopter and uh, the helicopter is remotely controlled by Blofeld, the very man who killed his wife. Now, it's just a funny scene because it's like they never really show him from the front, but you see he's a bald guy, he's in a wheelchair, uh, he has a cat, he has a white cat, and that he's petting the cat and he's also guiding this remote control and you just, you just see his hands and then you see the cat in his in his hands it's all like a lot of cut scenes and whatever and uh just laughing evilly how, how do you like this mr bond and he's like flying the helicopter and trying to crash it into stuff and james bond eventually gets out of the helicopter well he's in the passenger section or whatever and he has to get out of the helicopter and hang off the helicopter and then make his way to the front to the pilot section and then he eventually figures out how to uh take over the helicopter and then he picks up Blofeld on his wheelchair by the skids of the helicopter and drops him into a smoke sack and kills him. Blofeld is dead. Pretty much. I mean, you know, he could pull like an Emperor Palpatine and come back even though he fell down to the Death Star reactor core and screamed horribly and we assumed he was dead. But remember, Blofeld did all that cloning stuff back in Diamonds Are Forever, so... I wonder if the next one comes back with hair. So we get to the last one of these five. Not the last James Bond Roger Moore movie, but the last one in this video. Octopussy. Now, Roger Moore has James Bond in Octopussy. This lady right here, Maud Adams, was actually in another previous movie that I just talked about. Different character, but she played the girlfriend of Francisco Saramanga from The Man with the Golden Gun. Now, uh, she has a much bigger part in this. Uh, she's kind of a supervillain. She's Bond in the end, of course, because that's what happens. But uh, the whole movie really is about a... What is it about the uh, organization, which I think is called Octopussy? It's a secret organization uh, comprised mainly of female agents, some of which have like a circus background, which is really weird. And uh, it's anyway, it's uh, women all over the world who I guess that uh, they're running the show, their own criminal empire. There's, uh, curiously, for some reason, the, like, lower-level agents that uh, work on the base uh, for the Octopussy organization. I don't know if it's officially called that. Curiously enough, some of them are wearing, like, what looks almost identical to the Incredibles uniforms. Uh, and I'm not really sure why. But hey, sexy women in spandex, I ain't going to complain. But then there's uh, another villain, uh, sort, of, sort of a subordinate to Maud Adams, who's a cool name, Octopussy, of course, who uh, he kind of gunks up the works and he wants to take over and he wants, he's got his own agenda. Um, meanwhile, while pretending to be loyal, uh, to the organization, he actually um, wants to detonate uh, an atomic bomb somewhere in East Germany, East or 
West Germany, uh, I don't know, somewhere near the border anyway. And um, he's in league with a Russian general who is just over the top uh, from the first Beverly Hills Cop movie. Victor Maitland, yeah, he's a sketchy dude. Uh, he just intense looking European guy. Uh, you know, no diss on the actor or anything like that. He's good at playing villains. Most of the movie takes place in India. Uh, you get to see some of the Indian countryside. You get to see, uh, you know, the cities and the wonders that are to be had in that country. Uh, not that I've ever been there, but this movie makes me want to go there a whole lot more than Temple of Doom did. Because I ain't eating monkey brains, man. Anyway, this one is 1983. And the reason I chose to stop the video right here is because, well, I believe it was the very next year, or possibly the same year, that guess who decided to come back again? I'll let you uh, figure that one out, and I guess we'll uh, see you in the next video. Take care, everybody.